Paul said that he loved the church as a mother loves her children, as a father loves his children, and we know that's because the heart of God is a father and a mother, and for that we're grateful. The psalmist said in Psalm 63, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary, and behold your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Your, I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Since it, is, since it is from you, God our Father, that redemption comes to us, your adopted children, look with favor on the family you love. Give true freedom and anchoring hope to us and to all who believe in Christ. And bring us all alike to our eternal heritage. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. And our church says, Amen. Scripture reading from 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief at all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls.
1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 15. Considering this salvation, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. Hebrews 6, 13 to 20. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted 
to make the unchanging nature of his promise very clear to, his, to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be great, greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a higher priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. First Peter 3, 21 and 22. And this water symbolizes b baptism that now saves you, you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him.
morning, church. God has blessed us with another opportunity to come and to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We are grateful that we have this electronic medium that we can use to fellowship and to connect one with another. We come at this time to partake of the Lord's Supper, and as such, we want to say that the bread and the fruit of the vine are the two emblems that we will partake of today. In Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29, we find there that Christ himself instituted the Lord's Supper. Also in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 7, we see the frequency of taking the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and following, we have an example as to how we should partake of the Lord's Supper. The reason why Christ had to die is because of the sin that Adam committed in the Garden of Eden. And we find that when Adam sinned, that sin was imputed or transferred to mankind. So at that time, that sin caused a separation between God and us. So Christ had to die to remove that sin. We come now us to celebrate Christ and everything that he did for us. He came to earth in human form. And at that time, he had feelings just like we had feelings. And he did not want to die that cruel death on the cross. So he went to his father and asked his father, is there another way? And God said to him, there is no other way. You are the way. So Christ humbled himself and he died on the cross to save us from sin. We have today the bread that represents Christ's body. We have the cup that represents his blood. And as we partake of this Lord's Supper, let us remember the supreme sacrifice that Christ had to go through to remove that separation that uh, it was there between us and God. So at this time, let us pray for the bread and for the cup. Our Father in heaven, we come to you right now in thanksgiving for your love for us, for your mercy and your grace. We're thankful, God, for your son, Christ Jesus, who died for us that we may have a chance to be in harmony with you. We pray, Father, that if we partake of this bread and for this fruit of the vine, we will remember the supreme sacrifice that Christ has to pay on our behalf. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we have our communion cups. And I'm sure you have yours out there. Please uh, get yours. And as you partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, just remember the price that Christ had to pay for us to remove the sin debt. Amen.
thankful for Warren uh, being able to lead us in that time of communion, uh, meditation together as family. Uh, now we, we proceed into a time of offering, a time to continue that mindset of giving, that mindset of sacrifice together as we collectively do more as we can do, on, as we could do on our own. I'm uh, very thankful that we have been doing this so well, that we've c been coming together and giving together to continue to bless others and to bless families inside and outside of our congregation. So we're very thankful for those who have uh, uh, the continued giving for our church and the things that we need to do. So let's continue to pray for this act of generosity and this act of just this sacrificing spirit that you have just so generously been, been doing. Lord, I'm so thankful for our church and just the, the hearts of the people. God, be able to see the different pictures they post and be able to k keep in touch via phone and, and text. I'm um, just thankful to stay in touch that way and also just to be here this morning, God, seeing all the comments on, on Facebook. and uh, God, we are collectively together, uh, although we are separated, God. Uh, what We are coming together at this moment to, to lay an offering before you, God, that we recognize that our sacrifice can never amount to yours. But God, we are thankful for what we are able to sacrifice, God. So thank you for the offering. Please bless it so that we can continue to do your work on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hebrews 6, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of of Melchizedek. While I breathe, I hope. You know, we have in some ways been thrust into the present. The future awaits. We don't know what that future is. I saw an ad in the Christian Chronicle a few years ago. It announced the release of a new CD from Harding's a cappella choir. The name of the recording was Teach Me Lord to Wait. The ad had a box at the bottom where you could check, please rush me a copy of Teach Me Lord to Wait. We don't like to wait as Americans. This morning, I want to let you listen to some audio from, uh, from James Clyburn. James Clyburn is the highest ranking congressman that's African American in the United States Congress. And he did an interview uh, a while back. And in this interview, he talked with his granddaughter, and at the very first, you're going to have, hear his granddaughter say, has there ever been a time when you wanted to give up? Have you ever felt you wanted to quit? Oh, absolutely. When I first won in 1970, when I won the primary of the South Carolina House of Representatives, there was this big party after the votes came in, and everybody was jumping up and down and very happy. But the next morning, I went into the bathroom, and there on my sink was a little note from your grandmother. And the little note said, when you win, brag gently. When you lose, weep softly. And I thought that was kind of interesting, and I stuck it up on the mirror in the bathroom. So we go into the general election in November, and when the polls closed that evening, Around 10 o'clock, all the news media announced that I had gotten elected, that I was uh, going to be a member of the South Carolina House of Representatives. About 3.30 in the morning, somebody rang my doorbell, and they told me that something had gone wrong down at the courthouse. And I went down to the courthouse, and they told me, rather than winning by 500 votes, we have determined that you have lost by 500 votes. The next morning when I went to my bathroom, I looked up at the mirror and I wept softly. And yes, I thought then that this was the worst thing could possibly happen. But later on that morning, I determined that I was going to go forward. In 1978, I ran for Secretary of State and lost. Eight years later, 1986, I ran for Secretary of State again and lost. And um, more than one person said to me, well, that's your third strike. What are you going to do next? And I always said, three strikes may be an out in baseball, but life is not baseball. And so in 1992, I ran for the United States Congress. And this time, I won. I don't know. There was just something that kept telling me that you got to stick this out. And you know, we have a state seal in South Carolina, and the Latin phrase on the seal says, Dum Spiro Spiro, while I breathe, I hope. And I've always felt that there's hope. And so I have never given up. Did you hear those quotes that Representative Clyburn gave us? Three strikes may be an out in baseball, 
but life is not baseball. I think throughout this isolation and pandemic, there have been times when we wanted to give up, when we thought, well, we have all of the opportunities that we're going to have, and now we're at our rope's end. But I, then I fall on that Latin phrase that he mentioned from the South Carolina motto, which actually comes from Cicero, who was a Roman poet and also one of their Roman statesmen. While I breathe, I hope. One of the wonderful things about hope is it not only confines us to the present, not, it doesn't just keep us in the present, but it compels us into the future. We have hope now, but one day that hope is going to be realized. So look at 1 Peter chapter 1, a text we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. I have two things underlined in that in my Bible. He has given us new birth into a living hope. Some of you during this pandemic have had new babies come into your family. Maybe you've had a great grandbaby, a grandbaby, a baby in your family, a, a child born to you. It's a way that God reminds us of the cycle of life. And even though that some of us will soon pass on, there are those coming in behind us. And I say to our younger preachers in Florida and those that I get a chance to meet, I am really encouraged by what you all are doing. I'm really encouraged about how our young people in our church have faith because it's founded on this kind of living hope and they're going to have a way of living in the world that is better than what my generation has had. So while I breathe, I hope, the Hebrew writer says. Let's take a little closer look at this, could we? Before we get into the text here in Hebrews 3, 6, I want to give you a, a little bit of a lesson about anchors. I knew nothing about anchors until this lesson. You'll see a gentleman in this picture standing by anchor chain. Each one of those links is almost as tall as he is, and it weighs 500 pounds. 500 pounds. Look at one of these anchors. This particular anchor that this guy's standing on weighs 35 tons. Now imagine the size of a ship that needs an anchor that weighs 35 tons. But that's not all. In the next picture is the largest anchor in the world. It weighs 75 tons. 65, 60 tons of that is the weight, and 15 uh, tons of that is ballast. And you notice those jagged edges that are on the bottom? When that anchor is dropped into the ocean, and no ship anchors unless it's in 200 feet of water or less, this is something I also learned, but when it's dropped into the ocean, those teeth grab the bottom of the ocean and hold the ship steady. And I want you to keep that picture in mind as we go into this text in Hebrews 6. So open your Bibles and let's look at it and talk about it for just a few minutes. In Hebrews 6, beginning in verse 13, the Bible says, When God made his promise to Abraham. Now let, let's stop there just a minute. If you go back to the book of Genesis, you'll find that uh, God made this promise to Abraham when he was 75 years old. Do you know when Abraham realized that promise? He was almost 100 years old. 25 years, Abraham lived with this hope for a son. And you know the story. Abraham himself lacked faith. He tried to have a child with his handmaid, you know, Ishmael. But God said, that's not the promised son. I'm going to give you a promised son through Sarah. And the irony of it is, when God told them that he was going to give them a son, Abraham didn't believe, and Sarah laughed. And so when Isaac was born, his Hebrew name is Yitzchak, and he laughed. God for sure has a sense of humor, but God for sure will keep his promises. And notice it says here that since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Now, some of you have been to court, and, and when I was growing up, this was a bit of a debate. Can a Christian go into court, and can they swear? Because Jesus said in the Bible, don't swear, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. In my opinion, when I go to court and I put my hand on the Bible and I say I will tell the truth and nothing but the truth, I am saying my yes is yes. That's a way of doing it in our society. So here, God is standing in the court of the world. And because there's nothing else that he can swear by, he uses his own character 
to say what I am saying is going to come about. I will surely bless you, he says to Abraham, and give you many descendants. And after waiting patiently, we said 25 years almost, Abraham received what was promised. Now, did he really receive what was promised? He did in the sense that he received a son. But if you read those promises in Genesis, there's greater promises than just the son Isaac coming to Abraham. Isaac was just a forerunner of what was to come. The Jewish people, the tribe of Judah, the Mary and Joseph, and then Jesus coming through the tribe of Judah to be the Savior of the world. The Hebrew writer says, People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. There's something that happens when you go to court and you lie. It's called perjury. And if you perjure yourself on the stand, there's very few things that are more uh, dangerous or more wrong than that. Because if you perjure yourself, you can actually go to jail rather than the person that's on trial. You can go along with them to jail. So it's very important, God is saying here, that when it comes to making an oath, when it comes to saying what we're going to do, that we do what we're going to say. And he says here, when God did this, and when we go to court or anybody else and we tell the truth, it puts an end to whether the truth has been told or not, because it has. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what is promised, he confirmed it with an oath. So not only does God want Abraham to know that this promise is totally believable and secure and will happen, he also wants those who are his heirs. If you turn over to Romans chapter 4, you're going to find that we are all, by faith, the children of Abraham. So we today, who have hope, who trust in the promise that God made here to Abraham in the Old Testament, and that is confirmed here in Hebrews, when we put our trust in God, when we put our faith in Him, then we are then also becoming the children of Abraham. And that brings with it a whole set of rewards, a whole set of, of inheritances that go along with that. And this is what God is doing. Verse 18, God did this by two unchangeable things. Now, I'm reading that text and I follow it along and I'm trying to grammatically find out, okay, what is it that the promises are? But if you read this text along with Hebrews chapter 7, you're going to find out that the two promises are this. Jesus was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Do you remember Melchizedek? Melchizedek is, was the king of Salem, but he was also a prophet and a priest. And Abraham goes, Melchizedek comes out, and he feeds Abraham and his men after they've been in this very difficult battle. They've won the battle. They're very hungry. They're tired. They're worn out. And this priest provides for them. And Abraham, because of this man, he recognizes him as a man of God, he takes 10% out of all that they took from all those kings and he gives it to Melchizedek. I keep waiting on Sunday for us to have such an offering. But in this text, God is saying, first of all, Jesus is, is the priest of an order of Melchizedek. And secondly of all, he is an eternal priest. If you look at the lineage of Jesus, he is not a Levite. He's not from the tribe of Levi. No one could be a priest unless they were a Levite. But here, God calls Jesus through a different lineage, through the lineage of Melchizedek. This man that appears to have no beginning and no end, this Jesus that certainly has had no beginning and does have no end because he's in heaven with God, that's the kind of unchangeable things that God means in this text. God did this by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us, may be greatly encouraged. So we are, as it were, grabbing hold of this solid anchor, like that 75-ton anchor on a ship. We're grabbing hold of it. We're hanging on to it. We know that as long as we're anchored to God, we're anchored to this hope, we're going to be able to make it through. And notice he even calls this hope as an anchor for the soul and secure. And look at the preposition in the next sentence. It says, it enters the inner sanctuary. What enters? The anchor of hope. That hope that we have, it's not anchored here on earth. It's not anchored in the deepest sea. It's anchored in the inner sanctuary of God. It's, entered in, it's, it's anchored actually in heaven. 
So imagine now, the hope that we have is not something that will spoil, fade, or perish. That's what Peter says. But it is a hope that is, that is founded in God himself and in his eternity. So we never have to be uh, afraid. It's firm and it's secure. And another thing that's important here, he says it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. If you go back to Exodus 26, to the building of the tabernacle, you'll remember that there was this elaborate curtain that was made and put together by all of those that were specialists and craftsmen. They made this curtain to separate the Holy of Holies from the holy place. And the Holy of Holies was a place where only the priest went once a year to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. It was literally where God dwelt in that place. Remember when the people traveled, the presence of God would come above the temple. It would either be a cloud or a pillar of fire, and they would follow him wherever he led them. Only the priests got to go there. Now look at what's happening. God is saying, the writer here is saying, that God has put this anchor through Jesus in heaven itself, in the inner sanctuary of God, into God's very living room. And now that's what we're anchored to. So that is a major, major change in the way people lived before Jesus came. And notice when this, this hope was anchored in that inner sanctuary, where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This living hope does at least two things that I want to give you today. First of all, it gives us a safe and reliable basis for which to live. Now, I know now we're in a fearful mode. We're, we're afraid of what's going to happen. Even though some of our places, some restaurants and other things are opening up, we still have a bit of anxiety about what's going to happen down the road. When we'll be able to come to this beautiful auditorium and sit around in these seats and be able to sing praises without fear? When will we be able to hug and put our arms around our brothers and sisters and, and love each other again as we have before in the past? Well, one thing that gives us assurance is this hope. It is a safe and reliable hope even in the midst of perilous times in which we live. Number two, this living hope puts us in God's waiting room. Most of us go to the doctor, or some of us on a very regular basis, and there's a bit of anxiety about that, isn't there? Especially if you're going to have some kind of procedure. And you go in there and you sit and you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait. And you keep thinking, how could anybody run a business like this? You know, all these negative thoughts that go through you. When I get in there, I'm going to give the doctor a piece of my mind, or I can't believe I have to wait all this time. Well, life is about waiting. Life is about patience. Life is about this peaceful, peacefulness that we have to develop about our demeanor so that no matter what situation we're in, we're able to handle it. When God puts us in his waiting room, he's telling us like he did Abraham. It might be five years. It might be 10, 20, 25. It might be longer than Abraham's promise was offered. But the bottom line is God has taken care of it. He's given us this hope. He's put us in his waiting room. We're not waiting on a specialist. We're waiting on the creator of the universe. Abraham waited, and so we can wait as well. My song, this song that I have been on my heart, and it's been Billy, really my theme song during this whole pandemic, and it's called Living Hope, and it's by uh, two guys wrote it, Phil Wickham and Brian Johnson, and I want to share the words of this song, and hopefully it will give you some encouragement as it has me over the last few weeks. And we'll be able to take it with us as we go into a time of prayer and then go into our invitation. And we're going to sing that invitation song in just a few minutes. And when we do, if God has laid something on your heart today about your need to have a more confidence in the hope he's given you, to have more, uh, more satisfaction with where you are, more, being more at peace, if you need to be aware that uh, God has kind of has us in his waiting room right now, but one day he's going to collect us to him, he's going to transform us. I don't know what your response to this lesson needs to be today, but hopefully you can pray wherever you are, God, please increase my hope. Please help me to have a firmer grip on that anchor that you have given me. 
And today, if you're not a believer, there are certainly ways that we can help you. You can call us, our website, uh, melcoc.org. You can go there, get a phone number, get a contact. We're happy to help you. You can leave a message in the comments on Facebook because we want to help you with your, your life. We want to help you with responding to God, obeying God, if that's your need today. This song says, How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore open the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promised. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day that we can call you our God, our Father, our Sustainer, our Provider. For most of us, we have been so greatly blessed, even though we've been in difficult times. For most of us, we live in a country where resources are almost unlimited, where supply soon catches up with demand. But yet at the same time, there are those around us in our country and across the world who have very little and that don't even know perhaps where their next meal is going to come from. So, Lord, help us to open our hearts. Help us to be generous, caring, loving. Thank you for all of those that serve in our church to help those locally who have need, whether it's our food pantry or individuals who are going out and bringing groceries to those who are at risk that can't do it. Whatever it is, we thank you, Lord, for your provision, and we pray that you would help us to be like Jesus in our generosity and our love for each other. Thank you for this anchor, Lord, that is centered in you in heaven this anchor that is in the very inner sanctuary of your temple in heaven. We're thankful for that. May this living hope be something that we hold on to as long as we live. Lord, help us to know that as long as we breathe, there is hope and that we should never give up hope. Thank you for this day. Give us your peace, your blessings. Be with those that are listening wherever they are and help our hearts wherever we are to be open to you and to respond in obedience or whatever way we need this day. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace.
Good morning, church family. So wonderful to be here together with you all, virtually. And I uh, want to do a shout out uh, to all the mothers. This is your day. Uh, to all you amazing mothers, uh, just uh, my heart goes out to you. And uh, every, uh, family members, take care of your mothers today as you can. Will you bow with me, please? Father God in heaven, how great and wonderful is your name. Father God, we humbly come before you as a church family, um, just praising with song and with scripture. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you be over each one of our family members as we are, uh, you know, here together yet separated. And um, we help you. We ask that you uh, be with our our church families, each one, each member that. Uh, that you calm them, you know, take the anxiety away from them as we work through this situation that this world is in. And uh, we ask you to have extra angels, you know, protecting all of our loved ones, you know, keeping them clear of viruses and, uh, you know, just being mindful of um, their environment and uh, their surroundings. We pray that uh, we pray for wisdom to to know where to go, when to go, and what to do. We pray that you you be with our um, our shepherds and um, our staff as we continue to uh, to plan to bring this uh, church family back together. Pray that everyone will be will be patient. As uh, as we work through these uh, these details, and we pray that um, everyone will take the, this time to to uh, be an example of Christ out in this world. We ask you to uh, continue to bless our day today, bless our week, and uh, be with be with us all. And we just thank you for the the gift of the Holy Spirit. We pray for wisdom to listen to his guidance in everything that we do and everything that we say, everything that we think. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, dying on the cross for all mankind. And we thank you for being the almighty God. Thank you for this avenue of prayer. We ask for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy on us. All these we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. All of our mothers, I'd like to say happy Mother's Day. And we hope that you have a blessed day. We'd like to end this song that reminds us about heaven. Mansion, robe, and crown.